Okay, welcome back to part five of this Radcliffe Cardiology online program on POTS. Uh, I'm delighted to be joined by Professor Mel Lobo from BATS. Uh, he's going to talk about drug therapy in POTS. Mel, take it away. Thank you, uh, Andrew. So um, we start with this um, very busy slide here. And what I'm going to do for those um, of the delegates who are looking at this uh, webinar through a mobile phone, that will be impossibly frustrating to read, so I'll, I'll break down the sections. Uh, but uh, that proposes treatments according to the different subtypes we mentioned. Um, and it also gives some hints on non-pharmacological treatments as well. So if we start with the neuropathic form of POT, uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that this slide also includes non-pharmacological approaches, just to reinforce the other two speakers' um, opinion that um, actually it's the lifestyle measures, the non-pharmacological measures that really do make the biggest difference in uh, treating patients with POTS. Unfortunately, the patients often come to us with a very strong view that they want medications and that medications are the answer to everything, and that is very rarely the case. So we use um, for these patients um, with uh, neuropathic POTS, uh, in addition to compression garments, uh, pharmacological measures to basically achieve basic constriction with mitodrin, um, which is an alpha-1 adrenoceptor agonist, and although it says octreotide on the table here, in truth, uh, octreotide access is super specialized in the UK. And there's only one or two places where a patient can get octreotide used as a splanchnic vasoconstrictor and somatostatin analog that will reduce things like um, uh, intestinal peptides and insulin and, and, and gut loading, um, uh, I suppose. But um, this is something that we have actually very little experience of in my uh, particular center. But the idea here is that drugs that are pressor agents, so tightening up the circulation, so vasoconstrictor agents, mitodrine, um, are uh, very preferable in the setting of neuropathic uh, POTS. For patients with hypovolemic POTS, it makes great sense to augment the circulation and the low, relatively low plasma volume with uh, plenty of fluid and high salt uh, diet. But when that doesn't uh, suffice, and we have to be uh, a little bit sympathetic with some of our patients. They struggle because of comorbidities with gut um, transit, etc. that they can't cope with large volumes of fluid or they can't um, ingest uh, sodium in high quantities. Then we have the alternatives of uh, volume expansion with drugs like fludrocortisone. Um, and uh, this uh, acts as a mineral corticoid uh, receptor agonist uh, and is... Um, Moderately effective in some of our patients, but in general, not as useful as one would like, possibly because the fluids are not being um, accumulated in the right uh, compartments. And then as an alternative, uh, the vasopressin uh, analog, desmopressin, uh, can be opted for. Again, this is fairly highly specialized prescribing that we wouldn't expect to see out in uh, primary care. This would be very much in the uh, specialist clinic. And then to manage the uh, patients with hyperadrenergic POTS, uh, often it's about really avoiding those uh, drugs that can exacerbate their condition. And in particular, because these patients can often have psychological or psychiatric um, comorbidities, it's avoidance of um, SSRIs, SNRIs, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitors that are being commonly uh, prescribed, but actually can exacerbate cardiovascular symptoms in these patients. And then the simple uh, best approach is really a non-selective beta-1, beta-2 um, uh, adrenoceptor blocker, such as propanolol, used at exceedingly low doses. So we're talking tiny doses compared to what people might be used to in the cardiology clinic where patients are being prescribed propanolol, 160 milligrams in a day or 320 milligrams in a day. And here we're using 10 to 20 milligrams uh, up to three or four times a day if uh, tolerated. And in fact, probably that's the only beta blocker for which there is modest evidence in the setting of POTS and other drugs such as bisoprolol and metoprolol are on the list there, but there are almost no studies. And then to make use of, uh, um, I guess, cholinergic drugs such as pyridostigmine uh, that may have the added benefits of uh, increasing gastrointestinal uh, transit, that may be worthwhile in, in some patients. We also use clonidine in the hyperadrenergic POTS group that can take the edge off both blood pressure and heart rate rise. And the other very important drug in circulatory control, for which there is modest evidence, is ivabradine, so the IF uh, channel inhibitor that reduces heart rate without affecting blood pressure control. And we start with very, very low doses, 2.5 milligrams uh, once or twice a day. And I use it up to 5 milligrams 
four times a day. So I'll get up to 20 milligrams of ivabudine into a patient. But all of this um, drug therapy of uh, this condition is remarkably evidence-free. And I'll show you that on the final slide. Another way to think about treatment of POTS is uh, targeting symptoms. And you can see, uh, again, it's always non-pharmacological approach, the top three uh, boxes. But when patients are symptomatic, despite trying our best with uh, lifestyle measures, then we have to consider the symptoms. And if it's palpitations, tachycardia, this debilitating, then maybe going at them with the panel or, like, or abadine makes a lot of sense. If the issues are due to hypotension, hypo of limit, but then targeting that with um, drugs that are vasoconstrictors can be very helpful. And mitogen, um, we use up to 10 milligrams three times a day. And then uh, if patients are having symptoms of um, uh, brain fog, it says they're to consider more adrenaline reuptake inhibitors, but we have to be very careful uh, in that group not to exacerbate any of the cardiovascular symptoms. So it would be very, very low doses. And then just to undermine how little there is in the way of evidence to support the treatment of patients with POTS with various drug therapy regimens. We don't have any class one um, uh, recommendations. We don't have any class 2A recommendations. We have class 2B for uh, treatment um, with uh, drugs. Uh, although um, water consumption and salt is uh, only 2B as well, but use of food recordosone, pyridostigmine, margarine, propanolol, as I Mentioned. And what's interesting on here is that they don't really refer to there being good evidence for the use of intravenous saline as an approach for POTS, which is something that the POTS patients sometimes come to us and ask. So we're in a very largely evidence-free zone, and the evidence that exists is in strikingly small groups of patients, often six to ten patients in a group. A large study might be 30 patients. The studies tend to be single limb, they tend to be that, or crossover, and they often are exceedingly short duration. So we're really in a world that's uh, lacking good um, data to guide us. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Mel. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Over the years, uh, we've been presenting talks on hypertension with studies of 20,000, 25,000. And here we are, uh, a, a really important healthcare problem uh, with very little data. Yeah. Um, so these drugs, uh, so Nick, um, midodrine, fludrocortisone, propranolol, these really don't feel like drugs that I would want my daughter to be on from the age of 20 <laughs> through to the age of 60. These are, are you using them as a short term measure to try and turn the condition around? Or do you think they're okay to take over years or even decades? What's your approach with uh, prescribing these drugs? Um, well, so, so I suppose that the, the first thing to say is that nobody knows. Um, we obviously have a lot of uh, information to suggest that beta blockers can be taken for decades without a problem. So, so if we were to uh, to start off with a with a medication, then a beta blocker would be a good place to start. Um, I, I think I think from the perspective of long term management, I, I think the short answer is we just absolutely don't know. Um, however, the patients feel ill now, and we need to improve them now. Um, so, so it, it's a question. You know, I suppose what we hope is that. The lifestyle issues will, or the lifestyle management will make the biggest difference. Exercise, um, understanding their physiology, why they have those symptoms, and to an extent that things may get better with time. Uh, and so we use the medications in a relatively short term to allow them to feel better, uh, so that they can exercise more. Um, we know that beta blockers and fludrocortisone are safe in pregnancy, so we may focus on those. Uh, in in part of the demographic, um, it, it, it's difficult, and it's a balance of trying to get our patients back to some level of functioning, which we've heard from Leslie is uh, often dreadful, um, and hopefully that they just don't need to take those medicines in the long term. And uh, Leslie, uh, what what do you think of the effectiveness of these drugs? Uh, is it only a very small proportion of your POTS patients who you would want? to be on drugs? Do you think that a lot of people are trying these different drugs and failing? What's your thoughts? I do. I mean, I, th I think people often have to try several drugs over a period of time before they can find something that's um, helpful. Um, I think, um, I just can I just add something else to what we were, yeah. uh, what Nick was saying, that patients with POTS can wax and wane and sometimes they get better on their own as well. 
And so I think it's really important and when patients are feeling better to remember to try them off the drugs because it might be that they have got better over a period of months and years and they might not need them anymore. And I think sometimes this gets forgotten and people end up on them for quite a long period of time without people thinking about whether they really need them. Mm. I mean, even safe drugs like propranolol, they have a metabolic consequence. Mm. Uh, Mel, are you uh, trying to move people onto avabradine? That, in theory, certainly at the doses that have been tested in trials, is a relatively clean drug, a little bit of AF signal in some of the studies, but uh, it does seem to be a cleaner drug than the other three. Is it only a niche drug for you, or do you think it could play a bigger role? We make uh, plenty of use of it, and um, particularly uh, a lot of these patients with POTS can be either dreadfully uh, beta blocker intolerant um, with excessive um, heart rate lowering with even very, very small doses, or it can affect the blood pressure, or it just seems, the uh, beta blockade seems to compound their coexisting lassitude. Um, and so, you know, we have to think about other tricks then to, um, to, to, to target the heart rhythm that don't have such uh, widespread effects. So, so Ibabrilene is something I'd almost consider as a, as a first line ahead of um, beta blockade. Okay, well, we're going to conclude this section. I think it's clear we need more data and we need more treatment options. So that's the subject of our final section. So we'll close part five and next we'll be talking about the future of POTS.